Hello everyone, welcome back to my channel or welcome to my channel if you're brand new. My name is Mandy or Faye, whatever you wanna call me. Either one works. So today I'm making a much different, a much, a much more different, <laughs> A different kind of video. So this is 10 things that I have learned in two years of home brewing. Now at this point it's been slightly over two years but it uh, doesn't really matter. It's still like two years. <laughs> so I wrote some things down. These don't necessarily go in any order of like most important to least important kind of thing or the opposite. And of course I feel like I'm missing some things because I would like think of stuff later and I would forget to write it down. This especially goes out to anyone who is brand new at home brewing to sort of maybe help give you peace of mind while you're starting your adventure. I guess I'll just start with the first things that really like that I dealt with and discovered that they weren't such a big deal. Okay. So number one, don't freak out over temperature. So when you start reading about home brewing, when you start watching videos, people will talk about temperature, right? You don't want your mead to fluctuate. Um, you, you want things to be at a nice, like kind of even temperature. And of course yeast do better that way if they don't have that stress of like, you know, dropping so many degrees and gaining blah 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 right oh my god i was so paranoid okay when i first started it was in the dead of winter and in virginia our houses here aren't made <laughs> they aren't really made to keep up very well with either cooling the house because it gets too hot or keeping it warm enough because it gets too cold um so for quite some time, you know, things were nice, even like 68 degrees in this particular closet. But then when spring came around and everything warmed up, I started panicking because, oh my God, it's not 68 anymore. It's like 72 in here, you know? So for one thing, temperature is most important during the actual fermentation process. Couple weeks to a month time frame um, where your yeast is like actively <laughs> fermenting is when it's most important. Um, but if your house naturally kind of fluctuates a little bit, don't panic. Everything's gonna be fine. I literally cried. <laughs> I cried because I thought my, my mead was gonna be ruined and it was all fine. So just breathe. Number two, headspace. Headspace. I feel like that's a really big one that a lot of people get very concerned about. And there are all kinds of ways to eliminate headspace in your mead, whether you're adding more water or like honey water, or you add marbles <laughs> to your mead, which I would never want to do that because I just, I mean, there's a lot of liquid that sinks down in there. But some people use those things. In my experience, headspace has not mattered. It just really, it just hasn't. And I, I don't want to put that out there as like headspace will never matter. And like this, it's just like this weird myth that it's an awful thing to have. I'm just saying like, don't panic about it. So for me, I start to get worried about headspace. Like if my meat is sitting really long term, like if it's chilling for six months and there's a good amount of headspace in there, ooh, I get a little, I get a little nervous about it. But if my mead's hanging out for a couple of months, I have never had an oxidized mead. Like I've never had any problems as far as that goes. When it happens, you will see it because <laughs> I show all of my flaws on my channel, as you know, if you've been watching um, for a while. Uh, and yeah, it just, it hasn't happened yet. So don't panic about headspace. People ask me about it all the time. When they watch my videos, they see room and they're like, oh my God, what are you gonna do about that? Nothing, it's just, it's just chilling years or anything like that, so. Number three, use plenty of fruit. Spices and herbs, it's pretty easy to overpower a mead using those. So you do wanna be very careful with that. But as far as fruit goes, it's kind of like the more the merrier, to be honest. When I first started, again, this was something where I looked online, I saw some other recipes and you know, some people were like, oh, I just put a pound of fruit in here or two pounds of fruit. And let me tell you, this, that is not enough. <laughs> it's not enough fruit, okay. I have noticed as like a sort of general rule, four pounds 
is where a lot of fruit lies. Uh, if you use less than that, then you're really not gonna pull very much. Um, but there are like fruit bum mead recipes that doesn't use any water. It's straight fruit, just crushed fruit the whole way. And that's where you get like a really incredible product. I haven't made one yet, but I would like to. Do not skimp on fruit. That's the point. That's just the point I'm getting to here. Don't skimp on it. You want the fruit, <laughs> just do it. Number four, be weary of what you see on the internet. There are a lot of forums, blog posts, and let me tell you, just because someone did it and it's on the internet does not mean that it's good. Doesn't mean it's a good method, doesn't mean the recipe itself is good, doesn't mean anything. So be very careful what you look for. There's one in particular, and this especially is for anyone who's brand new to mead making. This is a very easy one to fall into because I did grow, forage, cook, ferment. If you look up mead recipe in Google, it's the first thing that pops up. It has a high star rating as a lot of people who have made it. And it is super, super basic and does not use good um, practices and uh, and it's bad. I made that recipe for the most part and that mead was awful. And it was the first one that I made. If anything is gonna put you off of mead making, it's like starting out on a really bad foot and making diesel fuel. My recommendation, uh, honestly, a good place to go for recommendations and assistance. There's some really great discords. Man made mead and doing the most. There's also one, I think it's called the Mead Hall. So if you don't have a Discord, I would recommend it. Yep, the Mead Hall. And you can just join it. And there's all kinds of information in here. It, there are really, really experienced people um, in there as well, and they will help you. <laughs> My number five uh, kind of tied into that one. That's where I was like trying to think, I wish I could remember some of the other things that I was thinking about, ah! But my number five was just don't trust everyone's recipes on forums. I suppose what I could say for number five instead of that is to always research how to use your ingredients. That's a good one. Always research. Just be really weary of the ingredients because some fruits like you don't want to put in primary, you only want in secondary or like certain herbs like need to be boiled um, spices you can either boil or you can dry hop with them um, i would always just double check the recommended usage that is i think one of the helpful things about going to forums and discord in particular number six am i on number six yes i am always take gravity readings you do want a hydrometer um, hydrometers they're gonna tell you not only what your ABV is, your alcohol, um, but they're gonna tell you if your brew is really finished fermenting. Um, it'll tell you how much sugar you have in there. It's a good way to, I don't know, kind of read your preferred sweetness level. And then you know about how much you wanna back sweeten for your own palate, things like that. Number seven, read books. I like books, you know? And there are some really, really cool homebrew books out there. Um, and there's some books where you can get a lot of very useful information. So I just like grabbed a couple books in my stack. <laughs> I have a lot of them. So for example, we have Mead Science, which I'm not finished reading yet, but this, this goes into like all the science behind what you're doing basically. Then there are some other books like The Welcome Mead. If you're into historical recipes, this is really cool. This is 105 mead recipes from 17th and 18th century English receipt manuscripts from the Welcome Library. Mead was drunk for medicinal purposes a lot of the times, and they, they're pretty much all methaglins, um, but there's a lot of history in here and it's pretty legit, it's really cool. I don't know, I, I find a lot of inspiration when I look at these types of books. And you know, obviously you don't have to like look at a book like this and make the exact recipe um, because we do have a lot of updated techniques and things, but they can be inspirational and fun. And you can find books 
that are very reputable and will teach you the correct ways to stabilize and you know watching the pH of your beads and things like that. Uh, number eight, nutrients are important. They help make your mead taste good. In the beginning, I didn't use them. I use raisins because that's, you know, one of the things that you see out there on the internet, use raisins. No, it doesn't work. I can tell you it doesn't work. And just throwing all your fruit and stuff in primary also doesn't work. <laughs> like you could still make a really bad product regardless of how much ingredients you add. Um, you know, obviously a lot of fruits, spices, things like that can add nutritive qualities, um, but it doesn't mean, doesn't mean, <laughs> It doesn't mean that they carry everything that a yeast cell needs to thrive. Nutrients, good. Number nine, stabilizing is not your enemy. And the reason I say it that way is because I was afraid of stabilizing for a very long time. I don't know why, I just didn't want to do it because I didn't like the idea of adding preservatives and things to my wine. Um, however, I feel mildly like a hypocrite. I'm just talking about myself because I will eat processed food that's full of preservatives. You know what I mean? And the preservative level or the, the sulfite levels in wine, even though it looks like you're putting a lot of stuff in your mead, it's like, it's actually not very much. Um, not at all compared to what you're eating in your preserved foods. And of course, you know, if you don't want to do that, uh, I point at the stove. What's that called? Pasteurize. You can always pasteurize your mead. There is long-term cold crashing. I don't know a whole lot about that. I did have some really good mead from uh, from a, a meadery where they don't stabilize using like sulfites and stuff. They store for a very long time in cold. It's like super long-term cold crashing and aging. So I, it is a method that works, but you gotta be really smart about it. For me personally, I have had way too many <laughs> meads referment on me that I just don't wanna take the chance anymore. So the other thing that I discovered that I enjoyed after learning to stabilize is the fact that I can make a low ABV and sweet mead. If you don't stabilize in any way, you end up with a very high ABV product. Like you're gonna get wasted off a glass, at least if you're like me. You know what I mean? That is what a lot of people want. Like they wanna just get drunk off what they make, but I don't. Uh, I want it to taste good and I wanna be able to drink a glass of it and not fall on my face afterwards. And last but not least, number 10, experiment. Experiment, experimenting is fun. Experimenting is a great way to learn, you know, push outside your comfort zone. Like I recently made a boche for the first time ever. I've been wanting to do it, but I was so nervous to cook honey that I just like avoided it for a long time. Learn how to use spices, learn how to use herbs, learn how to use varying fruits, try different methods. Mead, it, it, it's so vast in what you can do and work with. That's part of what makes it so much fun to make, it's very creative. So I encourage you to experiment. It is a great way to learn new things. And I mean, that's really all I've done on this channel. I pretty much just built this to be a part of a community, to learn and to have fun. So here we are, <laughs> here we are. And that's it, that's what I've learned in um, two years. At least those are a few things that I have learned. There's more, but. <laughs> I can't remember them. Gosh, darn it. Well, I hope that that was helpful. I hope I covered things okay. So thank you, thank you, thank you for watching this. Um, for those of you who have any other kind of recommendations, because um, I imagine this type of video might attract a lot of people who are brand new to home brewing or making mead in particular. So please leave your recommendations in the comments, or if you want to elaborate on anything that I said. All right, thank you so much for watching. I appreciate you. We'll see you next time. Bye.